Hi, I'm Lauren. <laughs> I'm Joe. And this is... This is Brain Stuff. You remember how sitcoms used to lay in those horrible laugh tracks after every single joke? Okay, back before recordings and radio and TV, all performances were live. This meant that actors always had the benefit of a crowd's reactions to drive their performance, and the audience reaped the benefits of that energy too. Right, so you might have tension during a sad moment, or a collective gasp at a revelation to, oh, that's his father. Or you'd have mass laughter when something funny happened. Right, broadcasts and recordings brought these performances to a wider audience, but some of that energy got lost in the transition. Every show couldn't involve a crowd. And you couldn't always rely on the audience to have the right reaction. They might be too loud or too quiet, or they might not laugh at all after, say, the fifth take of the same joke. The fifth the fifth take of the same joke. The fifth take of the same In the late 40s and early 50s, radio and TV engineers began sweetening audience reactions. That's mixing them to sound more appropriate. This became a huge trend in the industry when Charlie Douglas invented the original laugh box. And that's laugh with two Fs, because <laughs> Fs are hilarious. Yeah, it's English. It looked sort of like a typewriter, but contained 320 laughs and other audience noises. <laughs> like that. The noises were grouped by type of response onto 32 loops of tape, each activated by a single key. Of course, these days laugh tracks are digital, and they contain lots of sounds, though if you watch any particular sitcom, you've probably heard distinctive laughs repeat over and over. Which brings me to the next point, laugh tracks are terrible, terrible! Industry critics and creators alike largely agree with you. Pretty much everybody who stops to think about it agrees with me. I mean, you have to hate them, but the question is, do they work? You bet your conformist face they do. <laughs> yeah, have you ever seen one of those YouTube videos where they take a popular sitcom and then remove the laugh track? It turns into this creepy nightmare world where people say depressing things to each other and then pause for three seconds. Yes, I do. <laughs> of course you do. Who could forget being that fat? Sorry, I'm late. What happened? Nothing. I just really didn't want to come. Without the laugh track, you realize the jokes aren't necessarily funny. You're just laughing along with some invisible crowd. So one theory says that we feel social pressure to conform to the group. So you're, you're laughing along with other people to fit in. Sure. Another suggests that laughter is an automatic neurological response, something a little bit more hardwired. Either way, real research going back decades shows that laugh tracks really do work. In 1974, a study in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology showed empirically that people were more likely to laugh at jokes when they were supplemented with a laugh track. But laughing in response to hearing laughter may be involuntary. In 2006, researchers at University College London used fMRI to discover that human vocal sounds activated part of the brain called the premotor cortical region, which uh, primes our facial muscles to react. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that means when subjects heard laughing, they began to smile. So some theorists think that gestures and sounds like laughter actually predated speech. They came before humans could even talk. So could our vulnerability to laughter actually be a survival mechanism? We want to know what you think. Yeah, how do you feel about laugh tracks? Let us know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, succumb to the pressure to conform. <laughs> like it, subscribe to our channel so you won't miss the next one. And uh, check out lots more from us at brainstuffshow.com. Ha 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 ha!